Well, good morning, everyone. We come now to the 11th chapter of the book of Acts, as it tells us the story of the spread of the church within the the first century. So let me pray before I I read the chapter. Heavenly Father, we ask you to open our eyes to your holy word today, that we would have understanding uh, of what it means and how then we should live. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So chapter 11 of the book of Acts. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, You went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter began and explained it to them in order. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, something like a great sheet descending, being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to me. Looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air, and I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, By no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice answered a second time from heaven, What God has made clean do not call common. This happened three times, and all was drawn up again into heaven. And behold, at that moment three men arrived at the house in which we were, sent to me from Caesarea. And the Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we went to the man's house. So as he testifies before the crowd at Jerusalem, those six individuals are with him as well. And he told us how he had seen the angel stand in his house and say, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as on us at the beginning. That would reference Pentecost. And I remember the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard these things, they fell silent, and they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. That encompasses the first half of the chapter. Now there's a transition here. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists, those would be the Greeks or the Gentiles, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, He was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch the disciples were first called Christians." Now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them, named Agabus, stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. And this took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined everyone, according to his ability, to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. So this is God's inspired word for us today. Now by the end of this section in chapter 11, really the first 18 verses, uh, and, and counting chapter 10, Luke has told the story of Peter and Cornelius now four times. And in fact, verses 4 through 18 is simply a retelling of what happened in chapter 10, verses 9 and following. And as we see in times coming, he's also going to retell the story of the conversion of Paul 
three times. And I think that alone provides us uh, with great evidence of the importance of the particular events, both in Caesarea and on the road to Damascus with Saul of Tarsus. So let's start. The apostles and the brethren who were there throughout Judea heard the Gentiles had also heard the word of God, received the word of God. And that's how Luke understood it. That's how the apostles understood it. The Gentiles have come to faith in Jesus Christ. And this is the natural, again, the natural outgrowth of what Christ said, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. In fact, the language that Luke uses is identical to the way he described the reception of the gospel back in chapter 8 among the Samaritans and the same language used back in chapter 2 for the day of Pentecost. It is, of course, part of that fulfillment of the expansion of the gospel into all the world. So Luke refers to a group here in verse 2, the circumcision party. And those are the ones that are criticizing Peter, one, for, for going to a Gentile's house and eating with him, but also with the gospel going out to the Gentiles. Um, we, we have to understand here that um, this is, uh, it says those who are circumcised, part of this group forms what we might call the party of the circumcision or maybe even some of those Judaizers who chase Paul around in the epistles trying to make trouble. Uh, they're holding on to the traditions of the Jewish world and the Jewish faith and declaring that, well, they didn't become Jews, so they can't become Christians. Um, they can't receive Christ. Christians, the term wasn't quite used as of yet. So the Judaizers insist that in order to come to saving faith, you have to be, as an example, circumcised. And Peter once held these views. That was before his vision uh, and his interaction with Cornelius. So the way he tells the story to the church at Jerusalem of, as to what has happened uh, in his vision is, is part of that melting of his own prejudices, melting of his own expectations and personal traditions and, and what they thought was right, but yet God has corrected them. Um, God has persuaded him, and his, who am I to stand in the way of God? If this is what God is going to do, let's just be a part of it. So the church at Jerusalem, which, which was, the, in a sense, the mother church, that's where it all happened to start with and then went out from there, is faced with a problem that we would call traditionalism. It's aware, the church of Jerusalem is aware that things are changing, that it can't help but change as the gospel goes forward. And the question is, what are we going to hold on to as things that are important, and what are we going to let go as things which are only tradition? They understood if they expanded, if they were evangelistic, if they were mission-minded, well, things are going to change. And, and God has commanded the gospel go forward and outside of Jerusalem, so things are going to change. The question is, am, am, am I going to go with it, in a sense? So do you understand that the, the power of the tradition of that culture at that time and, and within the church is very, very strong? And this is one of those things that has to be overcome uh, so that uh, the gospel can go forward. Now we see that um, they're first called Christians there in Antioch, and they're called Christians by other people. The church does not call themselves Christians until much later, but other people outside of the church started to call them Christians. So, and, and let's just we'll jump up to verses um, uh, 17 and 18. If, if then God gave the same gift to them as He gave to us when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard these things, they fell silent and glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance unto life. So, uh, Peter does not say that they have to do these things before God grants them salvation and repentance unto life. He just says God has granted them repentance unto life. So who are we to stand in that way? So uh, this is a big break. The Gentiles do not have to conform to the uh, practices and the traditions uh, and the ceremonies of the Jews. 
Um, Because Peter doesn't make any mention that they were doing that, just that God came. So what he says there, there must be a recognition of Jesus Christ as as God's Messiah, Lord of my life, a trust in Jesus Christ as my Savior, a turning away from sin. That's the repentance part. Um, That there must be a receiving of the power of the Holy Spirit, which was done there. Um, and came in, 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 a, in a way that happened in the first century in a couple instances, not just on the day of Pentecost, but in a couple other places that were really significant, um, and, and to live life under the glory of God. And he mentions here John the Baptist, and, and John the Baptist's first words were repent. Uh, and repentance is something very, very important that, that I don't think we do enough or take seriously enough uh, we think well we have forgiveness in Christ well repentance is a very important part not just at salvation that we have to repent of our sin and turn to Christ but in our everyday Christian life Uh, repentance um, is a recognition of sin a recognition of what offends our heavenly father and we need to be sorry for that not just mention it say yes Lord uh, uh, I sinned uh, but to actually work to turn away from that and to go in a different direction. Um, because you, you really can't be a true believer in Christ unless there is genuine repentance, a turning away from sin and a turning towards Jesus Christ, embracing him. Now, if we had to, if we had, if we had to do homework this week, I might give you this. Write down in 50 words or less what a Christian is. 50 words or less, what a Christian is, and that has to pass the biblical standard. It just can't be your opinion uh, or a traditionally what we've held. It has to pass the scripture test. I think that might be a good thing for every candidate coming in to be ordained, 50 words or less. Now, this story of Peter, this narrative, provides for us really a challenge um, for our church today and and the church in the 21st century. God's expanding the church. He's expanding geographically the church as people go out. And this couldn't be helped. Uh, I mean, couldn't be helped. It it had to happen. People were moving. They'd they'd heard the gospel in Jerusalem and they were going back home, talking about it, sharing the gospel. It's moving beyond Judea and Samaria. It's all to the ends of the earth. And the focus of attention, the central point of the church, is no longer going to be Jerusalem. So for over a thousand years, Jerusalem has been the center of all things religious for the Jews. And now that Christ has come in Jerusalem, given his life, atoned for our sins, and now it has to go beyond it. And there is this uh, unwillingness really to let it happen Um, because Jerusalem is a hub. It's a place uh, in the first century as well as today that people wanted to retire to. It was a place that people wanted to be buried in uh, because of the view that those who were uh, buried on the Mount of Olives were going to be the first to rise at the return of Christ. Now, it's interesting today that people, that Jews all over the world still want to go back and be buried in Israel. Uh, And it is no small thing to make that happen uh, because it's very, very expensive and and land is at a premium uh, in those areas. So I just I just looked it up. I can remember when we were there uh, in Jerusalem, being in that cemetery and finding all those people from um, New York and around the world who were who were buried there. A plot on the Mount of Olives is going to cost you at least thirty thousand dollars. That's just the plot. the space for one individual, and then, of course, to make all the arrangements to get the individual, if you're in this country, over there, and everybody who goes with them, it's another ten or fifteen or twenty thousand uh, dollars to make it happen. So, if you want to be buried in Israel, it may cost you upwards of fifty thousand dollars or more. Um, but tradition holds those on the Mount of Olives will rise first. Well. You know, as, as uh, they're wrestling with the spread of the gospel, no longer is Jerusalem the hub. Okay, No longer is Jerusalem the place where it's all centered. It is expanding and growing. And resistance to this growth is coming from the church itself to some degree. Now, for those who resist the growth of the church or the expansion of the church or evangelism, 
uh, D.L. Moody had, had something very important to say relative to evangelism. He said, I prefer the way I do it to the way you don't do it. So uh, we look at that in our, our own lives. I might not have the, the perfect way to evangelize, the perfect way to help church planters take the gospel into other places, but we do it in an imperfect manner and trust that the Lord will take these efforts, sometimes pitiful on our part, and do something great, something more than we can dream or imagine with. So that takes us through the first 18 verses, now 19 through 30, and this is a transition time where the, the hub of the church is really moving from Jerusalem to Antioch. And Antioch becomes the launching place uh, for Paul's missionary journeys. And, and we'll see that as we go through the book of Acts. Now, Antioch was founded in about 300 BC. It lies 300 miles north of Jerusalem in modern day Turkey. Um, and during the first century, it was the third largest city in the Roman Empire, uh, next to Rome and Alexandria. It had a half a million people lived in and around Antioch. In 526, it was hit by the, what's called the Great Earthquake, which affected most of that area to some degree, and it never really recovered its former glory. And today it has about 35,000 uh, residents there. And in the first century, it was a real melting pot of, of different cultures and had a, a percentage of, of, a Jew, of a Jewish population as well. But it's the birthplace, really, for foreign missions as Paul's journeys go from Antioch. Um, and we can see uh, from what, what the passage says that people had moved out to some of these areas because of the persecution of the church that followed the martyrdom of Stephen. And part of this was due to Saul, obviously. He was the, uh, one of the chief architects of that persecution, but persecution of Christians across the board during that time. So they were scattering out of Jerusalem, which really was a good thing. The gospel was going forward. Now we're going to look at just a couple items in this uh, section. Look at verse 21 with me. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. Now that's an Old Testament really expression, the hand of the Lord, and it only occurs a couple times in the New Testament. Um, occurs in uh, Acts 13 uh, and the, the episode of the sorcerer Elymas and the other expression, the hand of the Lord, is deals with John the Baptist. But it's the hand of the Lord. Um, uh, it, it, it's, it's God's invisible Providence, it's his sovereignty, it's his power there. Um, but you'll notice the hand of the Lord was with them. It wasn't upon them, it was with them. The hand of the Lord uh, came, it, it, it's, it, it's not as if they sat there and did nothing and the hand of the Lord came upon them. We see that kind of reference to other places where the Holy Spirit comes down. Well, here the hand of the Lord was with them as they went and did these things. It wasn't that they could sit back and wait, the Lord had called them to go. So they went, and as they went, the hand of the Lord was with them. Luke is saying that as they engaged in ministry, as they engaged in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, the hand of God's power and his blessing was upon them. Would it have been if they didn't? Uh, the, the command was to go. The command was to make disciples. The command was to take it into all the world. So as we follow God's command then his hand will be upon us. Now, as the gospel moves out, there is always the danger that there will be a, um, uh, that error will sneak in, a watering down of the gospel, a changing of the message, a, a fuzzying up of the doctrine, because we're talking about, you know, uh, generations that move or away from the apostles. So it's like the game we played as we were little kids. You'd get in a line and whisper something very quickly in the ear of this one, and everybody would turn and whisper it to the next person, and we see what comes out uh, at the end of the line. That's a danger. So doctrinal purity was very important here. Um, and, you know, the New Testament is not yet written, so everything is still pretty much orally shared and taught. So uh, what happens here? 
Let's look and see in verse 22. Um, so the report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, the pro- report of Antioch and what is happening there. So the church at Jerusalem sends Barnabas to check it out. Now, Barnabas is a great guy from what we understand in Scripture. His, his name means the son of encouragement. Uh, we've seen a Barnabas in chapter 4 and chapter 9. We'll see him again later in the book of Acts. Uh, he is, in a sense, the ambassador from the church of Jerusalem to the church at Antioch. Um, Last, now, this is when Saul, or Paul now, comes into play as well. Paul had gone to Jerusalem, and after that, possibly depends on the chronology, appeared in in Arabia, and that's when the Lord uh, taught him. Um, And then um, he goes off to Tarsus. And we don't hear anything from Paul for quite a while. Depending upon how you, you, you understand it, it might be nine or ten years that we don't hear anything from Paul. Um, he is down there learning and growing, preaching the gospel. Um, and in a sense, the Lord is preparing him for the next years of his life as he will plant these churches. Now, what happens here? Um, as, as in Antioch? Well, there are the Jews and that have heard the gospel, but there are these people from Cyprus and Cyrene who come and speak to the Hellenists. As I said earlier, the Hellenists are the Greeks or the Gentiles. And what happens is a great number of Gentiles come to faith in Jesus Christ. And in Antioch, you've got kind of a different setting than you had in Jerusalem, uh, where Jerusalem is made up of converted Jews. Now you've got mostly converted Gentiles in Antioch. And Folks, it was, we've seen the folks at Jerusalem are a little uh, concerned about this. Um, what is going to happen? Uh, what's, what, the, the, what does the future hold? Um, and so we'll see in Acts chapter 15 when they have the big council at Jerusalem, uh, the decisions and, and uh, an understanding of what all this means. Now, w- one of the things that is really astonishing here is verse 25. Uh, we, we go back to the end of 24. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. As I said, Saul had, Paul has been there. And Barnabas is off to find him. Now why did Barnabas go to Tarsus to look for him? Well, it means that, as I understand it, that, that Barnabas gifts were not what the church at Antioch needed at that time. So he needed a a supplement. He needed somebody else whose gifts were a little bit different to come and help the church at Antioch. So he goes off to find Paul and brings him to Antioch and they stay there for an entire year teaching the church at Antioch. And what happens here is we see that, that, that it's listed as Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Paul, and then it changes. About, Acts, about chapter 14, it, Saul is now listed first, and I think Luke is doing that on purpose. And, and Barnabas kind of understood this, um, almost like a John the Baptist uh, moment. I must decrease and he must increase. Well, Barnabas says, I, He's going to be the man, apparently, uh, as far as the church in the first century and planting goes. He needs to be involved. So Barnabas' light kind of diminishes while Paul's light uh, increases. And, of course, Paul doesn't really care about his light. He's all about Christ. Um, So he goes to Tarsus to look for him. And Luke uses the verb to look for, which is only used in one other place. And that's when Joseph and Mary are looking for Jesus um, as they have left Jerusalem and they're on the, on, the, uh, on the way back and they can't find him in the wagon train, so to speak. So they are kind of frantic and they frantically go back to Jerusalem and look for him. Um, that's the same word. So Barnabas is really kind of frantically looking for Saul at this time, feverish uh, activity. 
So the people at Antioch had things that they needed to understand. This is a new church. This is, uh, they're coming out of a Greek culture. Uh, they really don't understand anything about Jesus, so they had to be taught really from the beginning, the elemental things moving forward. Um, so there's a relationship between the converted Jews, the converted Gentiles. That has to be worked out, um, and, and it has to be taught what it means to be there's no distinction between Jew or Gentile in Jesus Christ. This is the church. So what do we learn from this? Well, you couldn't be a nominal Christian in Antioch. Okay? Uh, this is a tough time. It would almost be like in Corinth. You couldn't be a, a milquetoast Christian in Corinth. Um, you, you had to stand uh, for what it is that you believed. And the same type of thing in, in Antioch. And think of today. Um, nominal Christianity is, um, I, I think, is going to be go go to the wayside, and with the distinction and the separations within our culture, either you're going to have to to buy in completely and live the Christian life, uh, or you'll just kind of fade off, and and uh, nominal Christianity will not be a, an issue after a while because it just won't fly in our culture. Um, so a nominal Christian kind of is tossed about by every wind and wave. And if your friends are over here, then you're going to go over here doctrinally. If your friends are over here, you're going to go over there because it sounds good. It sounds good to me um, rather than looking at the word and standing on it. And as society maybe deteriorates uh, uh, morally, ethically, uh, the distinction between the pagan society and Christians in the church is going to become more distinct and you will stand out from society more and more. So let's look uh, right here at the end. We see in these days the prophet, uh, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, verse 27 and 28. And a man uh, named Agabus stood up. Now Agabus, we're going to see much more um, Back uh, as we go in Acts 21, he's going to show up again. So we'll spend more time talking about him there. But Agabus predicted a famine that was going to come. Now, famine did come, um, really 41 to 55-ish A.D. It was probably worse. Uh, Josephus, the historian, says uh, the famine reached its peak probably 45 to 47 A.D. So he does prophesy about this. So the Christians at Antioch hear this famine is coming, so they're providing funds for the believers in Jerusalem um, so that they, they can help come out. The church of Jerusalem was almost always um, uh, under persecution, having a tough time, always in need of material resources. Um, but uh, this prophet here, and we'll see again in chapter 21, shows us that uh, there are two kinds of prophecy. One is fallible, one is infallible. Uh, now, Agabus didn't we're going to see trouble later with Agabus, but um, he does prophesy about a famine that's going to come. Well, it does come. He doesn't give any particular dates, um, but you know, it does, moving forward, it does uh, beg the question, what is a true prophet? Are there any true prophets uh, after the end of the first century, really, in the, in the passing of John, the last apostle? And what about today's world? Are there any true prophets? Uh, I have seen things um, by people who call them prophets, um, who say uh, we prophets need to get our stuff together and make sure that we're right. Uh, well, a prophet of God is always right. Uh, that, that's one of the distinctions uh, that a prophet that is sent from the Lord uh, is. He is always right because he speaks only the words of the Lord. So we'll see that going forward in chapter 21. But here we have a transition uh, from Jerusalem, really, now to Antioch. And then we're going to see a, in, in later times some other transitions as to the hub of the church as it moves further and further into the ends of the earth. So we'll look at chapter 12 next week.